Olá pessoal, sejam bem-vindos ao primeiro episódio da série Trader Talks. Nós vamos trazer para vocês conversas e entrevistas exclusivas com traders de alta relevância a nível nacional e internacional. Estamos muito felizes de trazer para vocês hoje o Peter Davis da Dixel Trading. Ele é uma das maiores referências no ensino de análise de fluxo de ordens no mundo e deu uma entrevista exclusiva para a gente, na qual contou como ele começou no trading, como ele se desenvolveu, falou sobre dois setups, compartilhou sua tela com a gente, mostrou as ferramentas que ele utiliza, mostrou sua nova ferramenta que ele está desenvolvendo, a Journalytics, que auxilia na performance de day traders. E toda essa entrevista você vai poder aproveitar agora, traduzida para o português, tá bom? Reserve um horário especial para assistir, assista inteira, porque realmente tem muita informação relevante, tanto para quem está começando, como para quem já está avançado no trading. Bom estudo! Hi Peter, how are you doing today? Good Rafael, you? Yeah. Nice to to have you in this Trader Talks. It's a special series where I talk with traders, important traders of the world, and I'm very happy to have you in this first edition. Thank you. Could you tell us Peter uh, briefly about how did you start as a day trader? Okay, well there was um I'll first to tell you why I came to trading and then how I settled on day trading. Um so when I was uh, when I was younger I left the UK. I'm from England and um I went and live in various countries and uh I lived for a year in Japan and uh I decided to stay in Asia and um as somebody from England who was living in Asia um the the kind of investment opportunities are quite different that are available to us so I couldn't have a pension in the UK um so I had to find uh, investment people in Asia to invest my money and I'd been uh, working for myself uh, as a consultant traveling all over the world so I had a lot of money and um nice. so but I I didn't know anything I mean I'm like most people I didn't know anything I knew you could put money in a bank account and I knew you could buy shares but I didn't really understand mutual funds and all that kind of stuff so I trusted people with my money and uh, and they lost 30% of my money <laughs> yeah the, I heard about this in, in another interview and uh, you pay for them to to lose your money absolutely yeah and not only did they lose 30% they then claimed that if I if I leveraged what was left that they could get it all back And uh and I said well okay if we leverage what's left how much percent do you have to make in a year to get the money back he said well if we leverage it 200% uh we need to make 10% in a year to get it back and I said so okay, okay tell me how will you make the 10% in that year he said oh it's very easy to make 10% and I said so why did you just lose 30% and he couldn't answer I said look this is you know this is not working so it was it was literally that i knew these guys had no idea right they didn't know what they were doing so yeah. i thought maybe yeah. i can um they i'll do it myself please about it, uh, right? yeah they yeah i didn't even know that i didn't even know what the fees were at the time it was only afterwards i looked into it so i thought well i'm paying these guys 4% to lose 30% it would be cheap and i literally said it'll actually be cheaper to lose the money myself and uh, so that's how i got into in into trading and it was good because i came into trading not trusting anything or anybody and i think that's a big advantage i understand and you came to trading as we came to trading we we are we have you didn't have a background of economy or something like mm -hmm. this that's right so what i did i When I got into trading I did what everybody else did probably I started to look at long term equities first which was fine uh, and I still invest long term but I still felt um a little bit uncomfortable holding positions for a long time and so I kept looking more and more and going down 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 to to lower time frames and um ended up looking at day trading because I was just more comfortable holding a position for an hour or two hours or five minutes than holding a position for six months. It was just really my, I felt that if I was sitting down and watching that position, that I was more in control 
than if I buy a position and then wait six months where, you know, anything can happen. So that's really how I got involved in day trading. And, and day trading, Peter, is fascinating, fascinating when you mm -hmm. discover because the leverage of, and we, in the beginning, in the start, when we start in day trading, we, we think about money, how to, how much money we can make. So, mm -hmm. uh, sh shortly we discover a different uh, perspective. Uh, we need to, uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I talked to, a, I talked to, um, somebody a couple of days ago on the phone and uh, somebody new to trading and he was telling me his goal was to make $3,000 per day, uh, <laughs> per contract trading NASDAQ. He was a beginner. Sure. He's a beginner. Yeah. But so $3,000 per day per contract is 600 ticks a day on the NASDAQ. That's and crazy. in that discussion, in that discussion, it was very difficult to say it's not possible because he's like, because with the beginner, he says, well, how can you tell me that's not possible? You know, I can do it. He said he can, do, I can do it on replay. Um, which is good, but, but it's like, it's very difficult to convince somebody that something isn't possible. It's like, you can't prove it's not possible. Right. I mean, it's like, you can't prove that there's no pot of gold at the end of every rainbow, but there probably isn't. And, and so sometimes people look at, they, they, they look at these big numbers and they say, well, I'm going to make $3,000 a day per contract. I'm going to trade uh, 10 contracts. That means $30,000 a day. And, and all of a sudden they've decided that's what they're going to get. And they've decided how they're going to spend that $30,000 a day. They've thought about the Ferrari they're going to have. They've thought about the big house they're going to buy, the island they're going to have. The supermodel wife. It's a and then when I, plan for the, uh, yeah. the beginners. <laughs> yeah, and then then when I come along and say that's not possible, it's like I'm stealing their dream. Yeah. And uh, it's it's very difficult. And so the best thing to do when somebody's in that situation, you just have to leave them and and let them discover for themselves. Okay, go ahead and try for yourself. I understand, yeah. Peter. Yeah. And you, you probably in the, in your beginning. You mm -hmm. passed through some lo losses and some theories that you follow in the beginning. How did you develop since the beginning and how, how do you trade in today? Can you talk about well, what theories did you follow that don't demonstrate that was eff effective? And now what are you using to trade? Okay, so the, when I first, um, I've got an engineering background. And so when I started, there were a lot of books around at the time um, in the kind of mid to the early 2000s. And there were a lot of books around that people were really, really kind of crazy about a, a few particular books. I won't name the books because I don't want to be sued by the author. And um, the books, each, these books, they described technical ways, technical ways to trade the market. And so as an engineer, what I did is I took those ways and I, and I found that every one of these methods in this book would not work. So there was, so the first, one of the first things I did, I, I actually saw a book that everybody was saying was great that described technical methods, of, technical approaches to trading. Technical analysis, you can, no problem. Well, yeah, yeah, technical analysis, but also approaches like actual setups. It Set was like one, one setup per chapter and none of those setups worked <laughs> as described. And it was, a, but everybody loved the book. And so... I was like really confused about that because it's like, okay, then I need to get away from this um, internet forum and, and that, that community. So I, um, I went to Singapore and I went to some, uh, some uh, we call uh, networking events in Singapore. And uh, one of the good things about being uh, a Westerner or being any foreigner uh, in, in Asia is that when you go to these kind of these events for foreigners, there's a lot of really senior management and a lot of senior guys there. So I went to networking events and I met a lot of traders because in Singapore, there's a big banking industry and there's a big trading industry. And so I actually met real traders that way. And um, it was really through meeting real traders. I found out what was really happening. So, um, yeah. So I, I even, you know, one guy I met, he retired at 35. Um, he'd been working in, uh, Forex, writing barrier options for Forex contracts. And he retired at 35. 
And I said to him, I said, well, you know, what do you think about MACD, stochastics and Bollinger Bands? And he just looked at me and said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I mean, he had no idea at all <clears throat> about a, a lot of that technical stuff. So it was really through that, it was just through reaching out and talking to people that really traded that I found out. Now, I think also there's a mis, you know, misconception that, that people think traders are secretive and that they're keeping, you know, they're holding secrets. But the, the fact is that if you're working in a prop firm as a trader, you've got no need to go to an internet forum and look for information on how to trade because you've got that at work. Plus you're working in trading, you probably don't want to be on the internet talking about it at night. So if you look at internet communities, there aren't many professional traders because there's no reason for them to be there. But if you talk to a trader, if you go to social setting and, and talk to a trader, they're very friendly and open. Nice. Um, I mean, if you think about it, Raphael, if you go to a party, uh, you know, if you go to a party, I don't know if you're married, are you married? Yes, I'm married. Uh, okay, so if, you're, if, if your wife invites you to a party with her friends and somebody says, what do you do? And you talk about trading. No, no they, I don't. They, it's, it's a secret. <laughs> that, well, if you do, they'll run away. Yeah. It's like you, the moment you mention trading, people just, ah, oh, somebody over there wants to talk to me. And they, and they run. So like regular people outside of trading think it's the most boring thing in the world. So they, you know, and that, the, the traders have that too. The professional traders have that too. So they like to have somebody to talk to trading about. So I think if anything you can do, if you know any local communities or if you live in a city that's got a trading community, is um, you know try and reach out, try and find some professional traders just to meet, and you'll find you get a lot of good information. Okay, this this network with professional traders, with real traders, uh, mm -hmm. was important for your to do develop your 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 style today. Yeah, because I didn't really know what they were doing, and so it's like it's really I, I knew what I was reading on the internet um, was wrong. I knew my experience of giving money to these kind of semi professionals wasn't working. But I didn't know what traders do. I mean, the, one of the most successful traders I met, he was trading um, money from a boutique hedge fund, which was about $30 million at the time. And he was day trading um, earning stocks and new stocks. And he had four researchers. And the researcher's job would be before the day opened, uh, find out which stocks were in play, find out how they'd behaved at a previous earnings report. Did they underreport? Did they overreport? All this stuff, and then feed him the the positions, feed him the trades, tell him what's in play. And um, I never, you know, I'd never heard of that, and um, it, it was just something completely new to me. So then it's just kind of getting that understanding of what kind of methods are out there. Now that was something I tried, but I couldn't really do because to do the research and the trading, it was very very difficult. It was a lot of work. I understand, Peter. Can you remember uh, the first moment when you when you discovered the order flow analysis, or some some trader talk about you about the order book or the this kind of things that you use today? Yeah, it was the it was the guy that was doing the news trading. This, this guy he he yeah. was using order flow. Yes, he was using order flow, but it was um, he was trading uh, Nasdaq stocks Nasdaq. mostly. And so it was using level two level and time two. and sales. Okay. And um, so that's how I first came across order flow. And then when I started to kind of uh, learn about it more kind of formally, then I, I, got, I got into order flow for futures, which obviously the level two, the level two was very different then to the way it is now. I understand. So you could see on level two on US stocks, you could actually see Goldman Sachs come into the market and everybody run away. And Solomon Smith Barney, and there were all he, these he different- He could see that Goldman Sachs was in the market. He could see- Yeah, you could, yeah they were GSCO on the level two. So every, um, every kind of large significant player had like a four character code on the level two. So Solomon Smith Barney, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, um, all of these big guys. And, and you could kind of, you know, you could kind of almost predict which way the market would react to, you know, one of those people coming into the market. And it was really, a, it was quite an edge. But if you look at the level two now, it's just all ARCA, which means they're all, they're all going through. An, uh, exchange. You can see the exchange, but don't, don't see yeah. the, the, uh, which broker. Uh, which yeah, but 
Because the brokers now just go through the exchange so that they can hide. You know that here in Brazil, we can see the exchanges. Yeah, that's good. That's good. But like I say, it was really nice for a while when you could see the market maker, uh, the market maker designation, but, uh, but that's gone. But um, level two anyway was a little bit more difficult to read because it's yes. kind of side by side instead I, of... Um, I understand. I never dealt vertical. myself with that level two. Um, and so, you know, I got a really interesting order flow and then just because of that, but I found it really hard to read on the stocks, especially when the, the, the market makers started to all go through Arca. So that was, it was kind of at that point that I, I, I started to look at, um, look at the order flow and futures, you know, knowing that like everybody has to go to the same exchange, all of the liquidity is visible to everybody and all of the trades are visible to everybody. And it just seemed like, um, just seemed a little bit more fair in terms of order flow visibility. Today, Peter, uh, you are talking about that level two and the, mm -hmm. the possibility to, to watch the, the brokers, the Goldman Sachs. Today, yeah. th this, this visibility, there is an edge in, on this or it's, it disappeared? No, I mean, what? well, they could always do this. So Goldman Sachs could put a bid in as GSCO, or they could put the bid through ARCA. And if they put the bid through ARCA, they would just see, you would not see GSCO. So they, they had the option to do both, but they generally came in with their name and, and to push the market around, so they were playing games. But that edge is gone now. But also the, the people that I know that work in uh, stocks, the few stocks prop firms, and I, I can't talk for all uh, stock prop firms, but uh, I have a friend who was uh, just a couple of years ago working in a prop firm for stocks. And not only has that gone, but also you have a lot of these dark pools now. And so what they do, a lot of what he's trading is, is putting, uh, putting bids into dark pools to see if anybody accepts them or trying to trade in a dark pool to find out where the liquidity really is and then trading the market. And so it's like, and it's like, God, isn't that a bit, do you not find that all a bit too complicated and difficult? It's like, you know, it's like, to me, it sounds like a lot of work, especially, um, especially for a retail trader. Because as a retail trader, I wouldn't even know how to, to do that with the dark pools. Okay. So I think you probably need some institutional platform for that. I understand. Nice. Uh, you you develop a very original way of explaining the, the, the order flow, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I can highlight that liquid consumption model. Dominant yep. crowd theory, the floors mm -hmm. and sailings analogy. It seems to me that you are quite self-thought. Uh, you develop as uh, independently and a very original way to explain the order flow. However, uh, have you had any mentors after this, this you, you mentioned uh, that you consider influential in your development? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of traders that I talk to. So um, John Grady is one. Certainly, I've learned a lot from John Grady. He runs a site called No BS Day Trading. Um, there's a guy called Rob at a place called Discovery Trading. Uh, we, yeah, we talk a lot. Um, we'll, we'll talk for hours. We get on the phone at night and talk for hours about the markets. Um, there's a guy called Gary Norden, who used to be a market maker. Gary Norden, okay. Nice. Yeah, and, that, and those are the probably three the most famous, but it's not so much... Um, it's not so much asking questions. It's more just getting into deep conversations about trading and about what's going on in the markets, uh, you know, understanding what they do, how they trade, um, and, and then kind of trying to fit that back to what I do. So I think it's good to just have lots of, um, lots of friends who you think are better traders than you, basically. It's very important um, to understand. Yeah. Well, because you, the, you are on the same level of these traders, I think. Yeah, I mean, sometimes what happens is um, you go through a bad patch in trading and, and it's not really working for you. And at that point, it's good to talk to other traders because sometimes they'll say, oh, yeah, because of this. And they'll actually give you the reason. And sometimes they'll, you'll just find that, yeah, everybody's having struggling with this market. So it's good to keep that network there because you, you might go a little bit crazy uh, just doing it on your own. Nice. Nice to hear this. Uh, do you think it's important, Peter, to, to have some kind of mentoring for those who, who are starting, for the beginners, to have some mm -hmm. mentoring? What do you think about mentoring, training, and educa tr education trading for the beginners? I think it's good. I think um, 
I think what you've got to do, whatever you do, is you have to have a way to qualify the information that you're getting, right? So if, even if you've got a mentor, you need a way to say, yes, that information is valid. So I see a lot of people that have built up this a strategy that's got a lot of parts. So the typical strategy that we see is people, they look at, they do some kind of long-term analysis and then they decide before the day starts where the high and the low might be and then they try to trade that. And there's a lot of different components, right? But they never ever validate the individual components. They just put all of these things together. So I think whether you get a mentor or whether you don't get a mentor, I think the most important thing is the way that you personally will validate the information you get, how you will check that each individual piece of information works before you make it part of your strategy. So if you, if, if you've got a piece of information that you use just to set the bias, just to set which direction the market's going in, you need to know that that works without any doubt. You need to know how often that works and when, and when it works and when it doesn't work before you bring that into your trading system. And, and each different part of your trading system, you have to do the same thing. Your, your entry method, whatever your setup is, you have to validate that setup. Um, when you talk about validation, can, can, you are talking about trading a simulator before going to live? Um, not so much, no. I mean, if it's just, so for instance, it might just be, um, let's say you decided you wanted to use pivot points in your, you know the pivot points? Yeah. Not much. So, so let's say you wanted to use pivot points in your trading and you just wanted to use the pivot points to set the direction of the market. So, so let's say I, I move down and hit a pivot point and then move up, then I'll try to take longs, right? So I'm, in that case, I'm not using pivot points to trade. I'm just using the pivot points to set market direction. So if you wanted to do that, use pivot points in that way, you have to check that that's valid, that you can, that pivot points used in that way give you a good enough result that you can rely on it. I understand. But people used to, to change a lot of, of styles and... Yeah, because, yeah, sorry, it, it, because the only way they have to check if something works is the p &L, right? Yeah. They don't have any... So you take, so everybody takes... Um, they take lots of different things. Oh, that guy sounds smart. I'll use that from him. I'll use this from this other guy and this from somebody else. They don't check anything. They put it together. They stir it, make their soup, and then they start to trade. And they don't have any measure of whether it works or not other than the profit and loss. And, um, you know, one of the things I tell people is if your, me your method might have a potential win rate of 80%, right? Um, but if you trade that method, the first time you trade it, you won't get 80% because 80% is the optimal. It's the maximum that that method can deliver. So to expect yourself to achieve that maximum the first time you trade it, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a little bit crazy. So, so then what happens is you don't know the maximum achievable from the setup. So you trade it, you don't do very well and you say our oh, setup doesn't work. And it, it's nice, just you, you didn't give it chance, basically. And that's why you have to kind of validate everything to make sure all the pieces that you use actually, actually seem to influence the market or give you a, an edge. Probably this is why you talk too much about trading, log your tradings. Yeah. That's right. It's very, very Absolutely. I mean, I had, a, I had a chat with a trader a couple of weeks ago and he got to the end of a week and he thought he'd done badly in that week. And when he looked at the results, he'd actually, uh, he'd actually had a 70% win rate. But his feeling at the time was that he didn't do well. And so you can't rely on your feelings when you're trading to give you a good idea of what your results were. You know, uh, you, you have, sometimes you've done worse than you thought and sometimes you've done better. So you need to be able to step back um, after you've traded to look at the results. Nice, nice. Peter, and then you, and today, what products and markets are you trading? Can you explain what are the tools you use and what you look to define your entries, what you have in your screen when you are sure, trading? Sure, sure, sure. 
Let me just, um, first of all, what I'll do is I'll show you my prep. Wow. Okay. This is and, uh, the journal. God, sorry. Yeah, this is where I keep my prep now. So I trade two markets. One is the S&P okay. and one is crude. crude oil. Uh, More volatile for crude oil, right? Yes, yes. And I trade crude just to give me some, some, a market to trade when the S&P is slow. And so um, it's, it's, it's just, just kind of a preferred thing. So for the s and I'll do, I do a prep before the market starts. Um, this is the prep for yesterday. And the first, what I'm looking to, to find out before the market starts is, first of all, will the, what's the volatility likely to be like? Right, so I want to know before the day starts, um, will it be a fast day, a slow day? Is there some news in the market that, that could uh, change the day part way through? Um, that kind of thing. So on, if we just go over what I did yesterday. So this is yesterday. And you can see this is the S&P. And you can see that you know, we, we kind of broke out through the old high. This was the old high here. We broke out. And since then, we've just been moving sideways. Right Now, right. if you watch the S&P, anybody that watches the S&P will know that when this happens... You know, after a couple of weeks, when you're in the middle of this area, it's just, it's really slow because there's nothing there for somebody to react to. There's no price there that's obvious that people are going to react to and, and they don't. So what happens, the longer you stay in the area, the more it slows down, then of course, eventually you're going to break out. So for yesterday's prep, you know, it was, um, you know, this is what happens when you're in a range and don't touch the side. So basically um, looking at the range. So um, you know, it'll break at some point, but no guarantee it'll open today. Then a screenshot of the overnight, uh, and then the news. Um, you know, we've got some uh, some jobless claims there that might help. But um, so going into today, my plan going into yesterday, my plan was it's a low expectation day because okay. uh, you know there's no real prices anywhere. We're not at a higher or low, um, so there's there's nothing really to trade off. Um, look for an early trade, which I'll, I'll show you in a second, the, the early trade, and um, expect chop, but be alert for the break. I mean, the breaks usually, when you've got weeks like this, um, the breaks, if it hasn't broken on Thursday, it's, very, it's kind of rare for it to break on Friday. So, and, I, and I know this because I've been watching the S&P for 10 years, right? So I know, you know what to expect. So, so basically, there's the first part of trading the S&P it's not, I don't believe that you can tell where the high and the low will be, but I do believe you can have prices where you think people might react and that, and that reaction will bring in more volume and more volatility. And I also think you can predict the volatility. So in this case, you know, I would be looking for sure if the market came up to this high, I would be expecting a reaction. I would be expecting an increase in volatility. I don't try and guess if it'll break out or turn down. I don't really care. I just care, are we now going to see an increase in volatility that I can take advantage of? So for trading the ES, I think it's really important that you do some, some kind of prep. It is a uh, kind of a dangerous market. It is a very, um, it's a grown-up market. It's not, it's not a beginner's market. So it's good to have some more, um, you know, some good prediction. And then in terms of the trade themselves, I'll just show you a, a very typical trade. Um, there's, two, there's, there's two trades that I take. Nice. One, tra one trade is just continuation. I just look for some kind of continuation, right? So momentum. The continuation. momentum. momentum. Yeah, momentum. I don't, you know, I don't really care about, um, I don't really care about uh, trying to guess where a move will start or end. All I care is, okay, if like, so for instance, if we came to this high and then we turned down, I would then start to look for a short trade. And uh, I, don't, I don't try and trade the high, I just trade the reaction. Um, and then the other trade I've got is uh, that I'll show you is, um, we call it an early trade. Let me just uh, go to the right slide. Peter, oh. uh, very yeah. interesting that you have two trades that you trade with often. Right, and yeah, I always trying to to talk with my my students that they they try to make too much trades, too much kind of trades during the day. Mm -hmm. So if you specialize yeah. in a, in a one, two, or maybe three trades, you mm -hmm. can make money for for living, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the thing is that, you know, I, I talk to a lot of traders and when they talk about their technique, it's like, it's like, there's always, a, there's like a big story behind every trade. And then every trade is so different from the other trade. And I'm like, how do you, how do you really know what you did? So they'll say, oh, I thought the market was going to this place, so I did this. And, it, and it's, it's just very, very complicated. So I can tell you this, this is something we call an early trade. And this is something that you can, if any of your customers trade the S&P or listeners trade the S&P, you can look at. So, Okay, okay, Peter, first, can we explain mm -hmm. what the tools you have in your screen? Maybe it's the first time that we, we, we are showing these tools in Brazil. Uh, mm -hmm and having you here in, in this interview. Yeah. And so just a brief okay. overview of this. Okay, so I'm an order flow trader. So obviously I'm using order flow tools. This is the jigsaw tools. So right. if I go, let me explain the DOM first. Um, so this is the jigsaw depth in sales, depth of market. In this column on the left, I'm actually showing um, a comment field. It's just a free format text field. You can put comments. And if you see the X's, the X's actually show me where we traded a lot of volume overnight. So what I do is, is, is before the overnight session ends and we go into the day session, I just put these X's in. So this is where we traded a lot of volume overnight. The next column is just showing where, uh, that's the order column, that's where you do your trade management. This column is the volume profile and the purple area is the value area which is approximately 70% of volume. Um, the pink one is the point of control, uh, which is the, the, the price of the most volume. And the orange one is the VWAP, which is a price obviously a lot of people watch. Yeah. Yes. Then on the blue columns, the inside blue column, they're the bids. So they are the limit orders, the resting limit orders for the market. The inside orange column is the offers. So the resting, uh, resting sell orders, sell limit orders. And then outside of that, we can actually see the changes to the bids and the changes to the offers. So I can see here, uh, I've, yeah, it's of the current bid is 56, but I've traded 421, which means they've added 463 contracts to the bid. It's very useful to kind of see the manipulation going on in the market. So that shows me what they've added or, or taken from the bids and offers, obviously the offer side here. And then in the middle is what's traded, the, the total that's traded this time around. So effectively what we can see there, we can see a market that's moved up and we can see we've traded, you know, 500 here, we moved up, then 130 here, then 300 here. And now we've moved up, we traded 1,076 at this price and, and 47 at the price above. Okay, so it shows us what's traded. Now if we start moving down, these prices will all reset because we're only interested in what's trading this time round. So if we leave the area for a while and come back, it's going to, it's going to reset so we can see what's trading next time round. Now over on the left is just a visual representation of that, right? So what we can see, we've got the, the bid, the offers above. So the lighter offers mean uh, an area where there's, there's more offers, um, the darker where there's less offers. So we can see here, there's less offers, less bids and offers around uh, where the market's trading in the overnight session. The green and red line, obviously that's the prices we traded. The color there though is, is green if there's more buyers and red if there's more sellers. Uh, the circles, they tell us where a lot of volume traded. Okay, and it's not just like the volume in one particular splice of time. It's, it's as long as we're trading an area and we're accumulating more volume, we'll get one of these circles. And obviously we've got a uh, blue for buys, red for sells. So we can see here, this big blue area, it's mostly blue, very little red, because we traded 156 Maybe sell market orders. In the, in the, in the yeah. okay. That's the absorption, yeah. So we've got 156 sell market orders, 1,076 buy, uh, which, is, which is a big, big imbalance. And you can see on the tape here that the there's, it's mostly on the large order side. It's mostly blue. Yes. Um, we've got cumulative delta here, which is net buys minus net sells, and then the volume. And again, the volume is colored uh, blue for buys and, and red for sells. And then over here, we've got some meters. 
the meter here is showing me the trades. So I can see so far 13,000 buys, 9,700 sells. And then here it's um, a representation, I think, of the market depth. I've gotten that one. Now, the key with this and the key with any reading any order flow is it's all about the flow. So a lot of people, when they see something like this, they go, oh, numbers. I don't like numbers. Yes. <laughs> but really, what you, what you do, and you know this, Raphael, what you're doing here is you're just watching the flow of the market. And so... You know, when I look at this, you know, I can look at this with an eyeball in a couple of seconds. I can say, well, that market's gone up and I can see it's like it's come to a stop here. It's 1,076 here and I can see the same there. So for this setup, what we can see here, we've got this area marked out here where we traded exceptional volume overnight. And, um, you know, we've opened, we moved down to the low of that area and traded at the low. And... Um, we're now back up. I think I might, I don't know if I've got these slides backwards or not. So um, let me just check. Uh, just, no okay, I'm actually, okay. Yeah, let me go um, here. This is, this is actually, the, should have been the first slide. Okay. So what we got, this is just after the open. We can see we opened at 59.25. And before the open, we had a lot of volume here. And so if you're close to an area where there was a lot of volume, there's a good chance the people in that area are still in the market, right? So if I traded a lot of volume at a price and I moved away 50 points and came back, that volume is not there anymore. Those positions are gone, right? So for this early trade on the S&P, basically you need to be opening close or within an area of high volume that was built before the open, right? That makes sense? Yes, um, people can understand this like a resistance or a support, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah, exactly. So it's using support and resistance, but not looking at price, yes. looking at volume. There are a lot of traders with positions there, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So there's a good chance that they'll defend those positions. And uh, this yes. is a trade. And so this trade, we're looking here, it's probably only a, a minute into the open. And there's a lot of people that say, oh, you can't trade the open, but um, my experience is that not, that's not true. So anyway, what we can see in this case, we can see <clears throat> that we've opened here and the market's moved up and we've got to, uh, uh, we've got to close to the top. Uh, there's actually a sell mark, sell limit order in here for 170, but we can see we've moved up and we kind of traded here a lot more volume than we've traded anywhere else. Um, we traded up here just 57 contracts and we came back down. So my, um, my thoughts at this point are this market will probably hold around here. And that if I get into trade, um, I'm probably not going to get a fill at this price. So this area where the X's are, that's giving me a general idea of where the market might reverse close to the open. But it's not exact. So, you know, sometimes in this case, um, you have to say, okay, well, you know, because I only traded 57 here, couldn't move up, and I'm now seeing this, this volume here. I can see over here, if you look at the buyers, I've got big buyers, um, you know, all, all, all here. And even at 60, 60, 25, back at 60, those big buyers are not getting anywhere. Right? They're not, they're not getting anything for their money. Yeah. And so, um, so in that case, you get into a position, you have to, you have to accept that market's not going to move up anymore and um, get into a position at a worse price. So if you then look at what happened, if we can see this, this is one of the keys to order flow, right? So I can see I traded 200 here and that ticked Great down. Great balance to, of aggression of seller. Aggr yeah. Okay. And then there's 145 here and down, 274. And you can see the amount of trade it took to move through each price. And then what we got, we're at the bottom of that area again, where we traded volume overnight. And now the same thing happened that we actually got us into the trade. We can see now, um, all of a sudden there's a lot of trade, 672 contracts hit into that bid and market's not moving down anymore. So there's the, if you look above, there's nowhere above, except the reversal above, there's nowhere above that we traded that many contracts without moving down. And we can see on the bids that they added 710 contracts to the bid. 
we can only see 119 bids right now, but we know they added 710. And, and that's, the, that's the, the, the open trade. So <clears throat> this is a trade. The reason this trade's good, um, first of all, people, a lot of people are told not to trade the open. Um, so there's a lot of people don't trade it. Uh, the second reason it's good is quite often if you get a day that's very, that's very slow, like we had the past few days, this trade will be the best trade of the day. I understand. It will, it'll be like you capture this move and then the market slows down and there's nothing. And then if you look, um, so we, we traded three um, at 27.57. If I go back to the other slide, we can see the three. This will happen later. We can see the three traded there after the 683. So nobody wanted to sell below this price. And then the market moved up and, and same thing happened. So now we've got a market moved up. And again, we've got a thousand trades, a uh, thousand buyers just didn't get anywhere. And, and that's basically the order flow trading. The market is ranging in the opening. Can, can we say this? Absolutely. Yeah, it, and it, but it trades around uh, find the value high volume. This area. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you were looking, let's just say that this was the market. Let's say we opened uh, where we're trading now. I would be looking at... Uh, 226744 and probably 26756 um, or, or actually probably 26765 here. I'll be looking at this, this area here. So that would be my X, my X. And then I'd put. Um, uh, I understand very clear, Peter. Yeah. Uh, so we, we, and those would be our, our areas to trade. And yeah. Peter, do, did you uh, scale out of your trades or some portion of your position? Um, okay, so on this trade, um, on this trade, it depends how big the area of volume is. Uh, sometimes it's only like five or six ticks, in which case there's not really much chance to scale. Uh, when it's a bigger area, like 10 ticks, then yes, I would scale for the early trade. How much do you use to scale out in the first portion? The first Usually four ticks on the S&P. How much of the of the, the your position maybe you 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 was selling ten contracts there? Yeah, be forty percent. Forty percent. Okay. Yeah. Did you did you uh, test this this percentage to scale out? Did you make some or how do why do you define forty percent? Um, to, not mathematically. It's really just over time discretionary trading. Um, discovered that was kind of the best for me. You know, some of the stuff that you do in trading is about your comfort level more than the mathematics of it. Um, the reason it's four ticks on the S&P is quite simply because if, if you, when you're trading order flow, you expect, you're expecting a reaction. And if you can't even get a, a fill, if you can't even get a fill, uh, a four tick reaction and get a fill, then you, you, you're not seeing any order, order flow event uh, play out. So, um, and 40% just because I'll, it gives me plenty of room to scale out the rest of the position. Very nice. So it's, it's, it's really more about that than anything else. Yes. Peter, do you want to talk more about these trades? The um, I can just show you the, the, the setup for the, the more volatile market if you want to see that. Okay, nice. Go ahead. Okay. So <clears throat> obviously, so the reason, the reason to have two markets is that there are times of year when the S&P is kind of painful and slows down, uh, you know, the summertime. And it's good to have other markets to trade. And one of the, one of the trades that I kind of, uh, probably a couple of years now that I, that I started to take this trade, it's the volume spike. And uh, we all know this, it's when a market starts to run really, really fast and it's going down and it's going down and you can see it going down and you don't go short and it goes down more and more and more. And you just think, oh man, I'm, I'm missing out. And, uh, and then you finally go short and that's the low of the move. So I try and trade against that. Okay, so you can see two occurrences this here. You can see the markets putting a big move down here and a big move down here. And you can see at the end of these moves that you've got these circles. And these circles really just show that as we moved down, we moved down into an area and, and people started to, to absorb the selling. Okay. Yes. Now we, we can see circle here and we can see circles here. So you want to see a couple of things, right? You want to see very high volume, which we can see on both of these moves down. 
because you want lots of people to get stuck. Then the next thing you want to see is you want to see some sign there's been some absorption near the low because we know that that's typically how the move ends. And then the third thing you want to see, you want to see the market actually moving up. So this isn't a trade where you get in at the low because you can, you know, because that might have got you in here just because you saw the absorption. It might have got you in here because you saw the absorption. Might have got you in here. But what you do is you wait for the market to move up. And, uh, and that's the, the other one of my trades. So when the market moves up uh, against some of these traders that are trapped here, that's when people start to get stopped out. I understand. Right? And, so, and so your kind of optimal position to get into this trade is, is probably somewhere around here that inside this circle area or above. Um, you probably, I, you know, this was just a screenshot I pulled. I, I most likely would have taken this long because of the move up, but I would have had time to get out. Right. Um, if you just trade uh, when you see a circle, like you see a circle here without seeing some counter move, you'll just get stopped out straight away. If you see the market move up, you'll you'll actually have some time it means the markets change gears. So you want to see the market kind of slow down a little bit. Um, but basically, it's just seeing these big, bold, rapid moves down. Um, and it's a trade where you don't have to be right all the time. It's just got a good risk reward ratio. So it's a, it's a nice additional trade and you can trade that on gold. You can trade it on crude, natural gas. You could trade it on Dow. You could trade it on NASDAQ. Any market that, um, that isn't as thick, any market that's um, very volatile, uh, you can trade this on. Probably gets a bit difficult when you get to really volatile markets like the DAX. Um, although I do, know, I do know people who do it on the DAX, but that would be way beyond my skill level. Um, to trade this on the DAX. But with crude, you can probably see this on, on any morning on crude. You probably see this happen, you know, three, four times. Um, so it's a, it's a, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, in a morning, you'll, you'll see it happen. I, I don't trade past the, uh, past the lunchtime, but it's, because it's, a, it's a trade with good frequency um, that if you're trading another market, you can keep your eye on crude. Um, and, and watch this happen and it's got good frequency and it's a it's a, it's a really good trade um, and, and as long as you're patient and wait for it then it's I, I'm a, a really big fan of this trade you uh, but it's a counter trend trade right it is but it's it's like you know it's different if you look at the move up right this move up here I, I wouldn't try to sell this move up right because this is a this move could stop anywhere right this move down is different. This is the market getting, this is like an overreaction. I so I, I agree it is a counter market move, but it's because there's such a big overreaction. Whereas in this, this market's just grinding up. This is actually a, a market that's kind of very difficult to, to, to find the top. This, this upward move is an example of stair stepping that you talk Yeah, about. yeah, exactly. Yeah, the market steps, you know, moves up in steps. So, but this down move is different. It's more fast move. It's more yeah. It's a blow off. It's a cra you know. It's a crazy move, and it's just and and everybody has done this. Everybody has like chased a move. Everyone's chased a move up or down, and that's what's going on here. The people are chasing it, and it just can't be sustained. This unless there's some big news in the market, right? So you know, if there was um, if there like for instance, if there's problem in Iran with the oil. Um, then obviously, and, and that's in the news, then obviously this is not a trade you want to take. But on a normal day, without any news, you're going to see this happen. It just means people, are, speculators are getting a bit excited. I understand. I think that the question here in this trade, Peter, is to, mm -hmm. is to have patience and to wait for the right moment to, to click. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, you, you need to see the move up and, you know, just let, let it happen. Let it come to you. See the move up. If it doesn't work it out, I mean, even if you lose 10 ticks on your losers, it's fine because the, because there's a lot of potential in the, the winners. It's a risk reward trade. It's not a be right all the time trade. I understand. And how, how many trades do you usually make per day? It's a, 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 a lot of people make this question for me. And I'm making this question for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, typically, three or four, five, maybe. That, that's kind of my target. Um, it just depends. I mean, sometimes 
Uh, I mean, my best days are when I lose the first trade, generally speaking. Because sometimes I think, Dan, I, sometimes I sit at my screen and I think, yeah, I'm, I'm the man. You know, I'm sitting down, ready to trade. I'm, you know, I'm the man. I know this. And, and I'm not really focused the way I should be. And then the market, market teaches me that I should be focused. And then I focus and I, I'm a better trader for it. So usually when I lose my first trade, that's the best day. I understand. Uh, but, uh, I understand. Yeah. Peter, I have a, a question from mm -hmm. of one of my students here. Yeah. And considering your vast experience trading different markets, which mm -hmm. of those do you think is dollars to win and why? Um, I, think, I think the S&P is a tough market. Um, I think it's a tough market because there's so many different factors that affect it. And, uh, and because there's so many traders trading it, it gets pushed around a lot. So you have to really know it. Uh, if I was starting again, I would not trade the S&P. No. <laughs> sure. Okay. So I had to learn the hard way. And, but once you know it, okay, you know how it moves. So um, S&P is a tough market. Um, crude, on the other hand, crude's a good market because I used to think crude wasn't a good market, but it, it has momentum. And if you can just understand, if you can, if you can buy when it's going up and sell when it's going down, you can take advantage of the momentum. Um, other markets as well, like wheat, corn, um, all really good markets. You know, markets that people that aren't so popular uh, are probably better markets to trade uh, because the, there aren't so many sharks um, swimming around. So, you know, the indices are tough. I mean, if you think of the index markets, the index futures, you've got the S&P 500 futures and attached to that, you've got the futures options. Then you've got the, an ETF called the SPY. Then you've got the 500 stocks in the S&P 500 index, and you've got each of those has got um, options. And then you've got arbitrage trades between the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ and the Dow. And there's, that's a lot of things going on that impact that market. If you trade crude, there's currencies, there's um, you know, geopolitical news, which isn't gonna affect the market on most days. There's not so many things affecting the market when you trade crude or wheat or corn. Very and with good. the S&P, there's a lot more. And the, you, do you think that HFTs is, is a problem? Well, you, one of the things that you hear is like, somebody will say, oh, the algos are taking the market to this price. And, and people say that, and it's like, you have absolutely no evidence behind that statement. So you hear these people saying, the algos are doing this, the algos are doing that, the algo, you know, the algo ate my homework. You know, it's like, it's, it's really it's ridiculous it's just the latest excuse for using money so i can tell you that hfts are mostly market making yeah they are They're, around the price but they don't move yeah, the price. absolutely right absolutely right so if you look at the s p i can tell you that when the vix spikes above 25 26 on the s p a lot of the hfts get turned off and then the market really gets volatile because the, the, the bids and offers aren't there. So to me, the HFTs are helping you. Yeah. Now on, on, the, on the stock markets, I think it's a bit different because I, I do believe they're kind of like stealing pennies out of people's pensions. Um, but on, 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 on the futures markets, HFTs, I think they're, they're it's like a, a, a swing trader saying that day traders are, are cheating. It's just a lower time frame. And uh, I don't believe that they're in control of the market. I don't believe anybody's in control of the market. The, the markets, if you look at the market, look at a chart, an intraday chart from 40 years ago, 30 years ago, it won't look that different to an intraday chart now. Yeah. Very interesting. Peter, uh, to finish this interview, uh, it's mm -hmm. about an, an hour of, of we are talking together here. Uh, can you talk about the journalytics? That, that Absolutely. Uh, yep. It's an innovative Two that you create recent recently and yeah explain to us how does this two work yeah so i created this because everybody's really interested in uh trading tools but not really interested in becoming better traders so i created this platform to, to try and help people uh see their results so basically what it is it's a platform 
It's separate from the Jigsaw product, so it actually works with many different uh, trading platforms. I think, um, I think I've got a list. Uh, let me just uh, pull up a list of platforms. Uh, I can't find. I can't remember the name of my website. Isn't that? Uh, there you go. Okay. No, the, the most of these tools are j journaling tools. But yeah. They don't have uh, some features that you have developed within journalytics. Absolutely. So we'll walk you through it. So the platforms we have Day Trader, MT4, MT5, NT8, XTrader, and, and these data feeds. So the platform itself, there's, there's kind of two components to the platform. First is the day overview. So we, the day overview is kind of the like a real-time assistant and it's got a few different components first of all we have um, a live news feed so if you want to know um, if you want to know you know if the market moves and you're not sure why the market moved you can actually look at the live news feed here to see what's going on we've got uh, economic releases from all over the world you can actually uh, if you're interested in um, you know economic releases from Kazakhstan uh, you can actually select those on here. Nice. Um, then, then we've got trade performance, we've got a risk chart, and then we've got some, uh, some P&L. So the way this works is during the day, um, if there's an economic release uh, due, you'll actually get a five-minute and a one-minute warning, uh, an audio warning and an alert. Um, if there's a, once an economic release has been made, again, you'll get a notification telling you what the results were. Also, if you take a trade, if we just um, just take a SIM trade here, just take a trade on gold. Oh, nice. Okay. Is there, is so, there a way for us to tag our traders, our, our trades? Yeah, absolutely. So if you see there, what I did, I took a trade on, on gold, and then immediately I've got this notification. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Just, yeah, okay. So I can click that. And once I click that, I can then actually say, okay, that's a scalp. Um, and I can put some notes in here. I can actually put some hashtags in there for analysis. Um, if I take a screenshot, uh, just take a screenshot. Okay. I can actually put a screenshot in there. Yeah. And, um, and, and I can also put some kind of emotional tags, how I feel in the trade. And so what, it, what it's giving you there, it's giving you like a one-click way to get to your trading journal. Because one, one of the reasons people don't keep a trading journal is because it's, it's difficult to do when you're trading. I mean, do you write it down or a spreadsheet? But with this, the moment you open or close a trade, I mean, if we go and close that trade now, how's um, it a break even? Uh, let's just get out. And I didn't get filled yet. Sorry, let me just get out of that trade. Okay, so I've just exited that trade. And then we'll get another notification. And what you'll see as well, you'll get the notification. Also, the risk chart will change when I get out of the position and the PL will change. And um, I can go back and I can edit, edit um, notes about my exit as well. But from the moment you click buy or sell, you will just get this immediate notification that you click and then you can do your journal. Um, so that's the, that's the daily view. And then I can go back to, to different days and I can see the, the overall risk here. So I can see the performance on any day. I can see the p &L. And if you look at the p &L, you see the red dot? Yes, what, that's what the red dot? Yeah, that's actually showing me which news events occurred at that time. Oh, okay. So I can see the impact of the news. And then the risk down here is showing me how, what my exposure is in terms of number of contracts. So I can actually see how much risk I'm taking as I go through the day. And I can just scroll back uh, to my, you know, through the days. I can look at my, my prep that I put in at the start of the day. Very interesting. Uh, I wish you very su success for you with the journalytics. Uh, Jigsaw Day Trader, it's a success now. You are selling the, the tool, the platform for proprietary traders around the world, right? Yeah, absolutely, yes. 
I noticed that you are very, being very busy giving webinars in different prop tradings, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, um, it's part of the business is uh, getting the message out there. And um, we like to bring prop traders, do webinars with real life prop traders. So they try and spread the message to people about what, what trading really is about. Okay, Peter, I'm very happy. I'm, I'm, I'm very thanks for you for this chat. I'm sure this content will greatly help the beginners and advanced traders here in Brazil. Very thanks, I, and I hope we can do the part two of this in the future. I love it, love to, Raphael, and um, good luck to all of your uh, aspiring traders as well. Many thanks. Thank you, Raphael.